Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of Trainers Corner. We are here with Sarah Wings today. Hello, Sarah. Hello, hello. And we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, and I think the topic that is often often used in various uh, aspects in animal training, and it's pressure, right? Mm -hmm. It's what exactly is pressure, how we use the word pressure to describe things that happen in a training session, because mm -hmm. I think that we use it in so many different situations that there is no one clear definition of what exactly are we talking about. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, the other word I wanted to throw in the mix today to just operationalize as carefully as possible is the word conflict. Because mm -hmm. I've been using that word a lot in my uh, control is an illusion class. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea there, and it does tie in with the idea of one, one version of pressure, mm -hmm. um, is uh, the idea of when we when we control the reinforcement and the animal wants that reinforcement and the behavior we want is contingent on the reinforcement anytime you have that mm -hmm. setup you it's like the it's like the force in star wars you it's like you can use the good side you know what i mean or it's there's a, there's a little bit of a dark side to it mm -hmm. the on the good side is that joy of uh, anticipation anticipation and control and I can control my outcomes and I know how to get that reinforcer and my behavior makes it happen and when you have that feeling if from your animal you don't have this sense of conflict you don't have a sense of uh, it, it's very much like I am so eager to do this thing for you um, that if you put treats all over the floor that's that contra freeloading idea the animal would still come and choose to work with you because it is really mm -hmm. fun to, it's really fun to do it. And that's our, that's our goal. That's our dream is that the behaviors are offered in that spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but there are times that uh, when you're saying, Hey, to get this thing, mm -hmm. uh, you have to do something you don't want. You mm -hmm. have to give up something that you would rather have. Or sometimes it's very subtle. Like with my dog Tucker, uh, it's, I'm going to ask you to do a behavior, but for some reason today, mm -hmm. um, maybe his, he, he just had surgery this year. So sometimes I feel like there might be stiffness in his legs mm -hmm. and I'll ask him for a backing up behavior. Mm -hmm. And let's say yesterday I felt nothing but anticipatory joy, which I can define for you. But today when I ask for it, I get barking mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly why. You know, to me, the antecedents look the same, the reinforcer looks the same, the cue looks the same, but for some reason today, it, it, I get a bark. So um, if I keep asking for that behavior again and again and say, and I, and I withhold that reinforcement and say, you can't until, have this, yeah, until, until you today. do this behavior I want, um, that's where we kind of get, we cross into that line of pressure. Um, that's one way. And I think I would call that conflict, which is he wants what I have, but the thing I'm asking for is for some reason in that moment um, is not something that he wants to do. And I get, I know I'm thinking, I'm talking as if I know what's in his head, but whatever is happening is it, the, the antecedents are in this moment mm -hmm. are combining with motivating operations to create a barking behavior or a resurgence of a behavior that he tends to do, um, I find uh, the reinforcement for Tucker's barking is often negative reinforcement, which means the pressure goes away. Uh, okay. The training task gets easier, which I listen to. You know, I listen to it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. do you see what I mean? The way you cross okay. into negative reinforcement, even though you're using a positive reinforcer there. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah, so there was a lot to unpack there but maybe you have uh, questions maybe we yeah, can yeah alexandra curland said that even if you use uh treats and positive reinforcement like if you use uh treats to you deliver treats it's not always positive reinforcement so even if you add uh all the good stuff in your training it's not always going to create positive reinforcement so 
Uh, right. It's right. not. It's not only about the fact that you have treats, right? Right. Right. So I looked at. You know, I often look at when Tucker barks. I usually mm -hmm. will s stop the session, or I will give him a break, or mm -hmm. I will walk around together, so or he right. can escape, avoid, uh, in a sense, the situation right. that's right. Okay. Uh, that was and, right. And that's my, I mean, I want to listen to that. I'm not saying don't listen, but mm -hmm. once that happens, you have to see it as, oh, that was a moment of pressure. That was a moment of conflict. And the, the real reinforcement I actually gave him there was negative reinforcement. And you have to see that because then you don't repeat it again and again and again. You say, okay, let's, we're, we're going to go a different road. We're going to let this one go today. I'm going to rethink my plan maybe mm -hmm. for tomorrow, but you don't stay there and go, but I said back up, you have to do it in order to get this. You see? Yeah. So can we say like, from what you said, I have picked out like two, two definitions, let's say of pressure. One would be if you have no skills and you don't know what to do to get reinforcer. Mm -hmm. So, someone is asking you to do something and you don't you have no idea how to do that even though you want that thing they have you right. have no idea how to get it and you would do anything actually to get it but you have no idea how to do it right and the other situation where we can talk about pressure and conflict is what you described now with Tacker. so that would be a negative reinforcement contingency where you have uh, aversive or irritant stimuli mm -hmm. and uh, you just want to get away. Right. So yeah, negative reinforcement. Right. right. And so that happens a lot them. with those, those dogs we call soft, right? Mm. They have, they have a so built-in... examples. I know. Well, they have a built-in response mechanism to pressure. Um, oh, the trainer is coming. She's going to say commands, you know, she's, and you'll see the dogs kind of go, okay, I'll do, I'll do it once or twice. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go sniff. Yeah. Or, and, look, or but, find something in the environment that suddenly becomes the most interesting thing. Okay, go lay down. Go on. Speaking of pressure, I'm getting pressured right now. Uh, <laughs> Tucker, has a way, <laughs> I, Tucker has a way to pressure me. I call it, I'm being breathed at. <laughs> breathing he's breathing directly at me it's it's his it's instead of barking Here, Tucky, okay. can you go lay down oh let's not go under this table go can you go lay down on this side thank you you'll knock the whole table over buddy there you go thank you sweetie i'm I not playing right now so many examples of yeah. gapcha yeah uh doing all those what we may call displacement behaviors yeah uh when we like from the past our past life mm -hmm. uh, where I wasn't using any physical corrections like e right. from collar and training or e collar to teach him behaviors or to stop the behaviors but I was using so much pressure in uh, in a sense like what you have described with negative reinforcement but mm -hmm. also in a sense if uh, I'm asking him to do things he doesn't know uh, he doesn't know how to do for the thing that I have Mm, so those both types of conflict and pressure that basically the most like the, the worst situation was uh, when he ran away from me from the ring mm -hmm. uh, because every situation in training and suddenly he stopped working on grass that was the first thing like grass was wet grass then wet, yeah first was wet grass then it was grass in general then it was sand then it was uh concrete then it was like every like there was yeah. suddenly he didn't work anywhere yeah he well you, you've you've identified another level of pressure i that i would call that environmental pressure mm -hmm. there's another level to it is yeah. you have to fulfill this contingency and you have to do it on wet grass mm -hmm. yeah right and maybe you have to do it 10 times in a row with your muscles getting tired or you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. it builds. So, and there yeah. is no clarity. I think the big factor in the pressure and conflict is what you said at the beginning, because I think it happens a lot 
uh, equally with negative reinforcements is often combined. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have not explained properly to our learner what they have to do, what are the criteria. And uh, this is what we talked in the first episode of the Docker Report, actually, that precision is not pressure. That precision, if you lay criteria very clearly, is actually giving more information to the learner and making learning process more accessible for the learner. Then if you have very vague criteria and the learner doesn't know what exactly has to do to get to the reinforcer. Right. So definitely a layer would be how hard of a puzzle does this learner have to solve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be another layer. I think it's really good for people to think in layers. Of, okay, I'm in a new environment. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on a new behavior. I, I've been working for more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. I, you, do you know, like you can actually start to, I mean, we often describe that as criteria. We say, you know, if you're in a new environment. Or distractions. Short, or distract, like shorten your session. Uh, but you know what people often do is like, I'm in a new environment. I'm going to bring higher value reinforcers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to counter this. And as soon as you start thinking that way, it probably means you need to be watching out for pressure. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it might be environmental or uh, it might be. So, but that's what's really helpful is to define what the learner looks like when they are not experiencing pressure. That's because yeah. we want to work. We want that. We want to make that happen. So what does that look like? And what do I do also? Because if what you said, I need to bring better reinforcers, right? I need to bring like more valuable reinforcers. That's a thing that, of course, we need to use. Like there is a value in reinforcers and sometimes we need to uh, differentiate you. But if for this behavior, I usually use this type of food right and then right. suddenly i see that i need to bring, bring something hundred times more valuable for my dog and i still have a hard time to get this behavior then right. probably it's something to think about it's like a red flag that you should see right. that maybe right. it's not the best i think it's better to work on even if you work in a different environment in a difficult environment sometimes i think it's better to get this really tiny, precise look of very easy behavior, of like the tiniest possible that you can get without any pressure. Like, uh, let it be even a second of like a call, approaching the handler or doing like taking food, anything. Just taking food. It depends what's easy for the particular learner. So yeah. something that your learner can do very fluently so right. something really easy for him and I would rather have a one two second session of taking food and that is a clean loop than one minute of a session where my learner is sniffing grass is going away from me coming back then looking around then I have to bring more valuable treats then right. I still have to restrict his movement because I have to block him with the leash because I don't, because if I don't, he's going to move away and walk away from me. Right. So one of, the, um, one of the top ways that I find, the easiest way to relieve pressure or to make sure you're not starting on the dark side is to focus on your reinforcement strategies first. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in any new environment, because... If your reinforcement strategies are not working, right? If the animal is too worried to eat mm -hmm. uh, or whatever, yeah. then the whole rest of it is gonna be weak, all of it, yeah. right? So, so that one might be something that I would find, if you think of uh, accepting the food or the toy or whatever as a behavior itself mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So, and then, how does that animal respond to the cue of you holding food up? Yeah. It, Cause what you'll see when there's no conflict is this eagerness. You'll see this. They're completely focused on the pattern that it's like, there's a little bubble between around you and your mm -hmm. learner. 
uh, the environment doesn't even feel like it's there because that loop is so clean and, and there's such a, oh, here comes the, it, it, the food is coming out again and here it is. And they, um, but you don't have a lot of like staring around and then, oh, I, I think I can eat your food. Mm -hmm. You don't see, if you don't see that, then you are safe to go to the next level, which might be capturing uh, a specific behavior off cue. Mm -hmm. um, if that looks good, if that's looking, because you, you're, you're sort of expanding the loop a little bit, you might expand mm -hmm. it to offered eye contact, right? What Kay Lawrence calls it cue seeking. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, you might expand. Now, now you have eye contact, food delivery. Yeah. eating, eye contact, food delivery, eating. Okay, we have a now, it's clean. Oh, now maybe you move into a situation where you can set up the environment that cues another off-cue behavior, like yeah. uh, a default sit. Or, And I'm very clear when my, uh, with my off-cue behaviors with my guys. So most often my guys are going to offer me standing with eye contact mm -hmm. as their default Um but if all of that's looking good, then you might move into your cued behaviors, your actual, but the last, that would be the last thing. Cause I feel like the pressure usually starts when you start giving cues, like sit down, heel, stand or whatever. As soon as I, that's been my experience, that's when I start to see if there's going to be a, a problems, uh, I start to see it there. Do you think because we have, uh, it's kind of because we are sometimes still in the mindset of, oh, I set the cue, how we, how we perceive errors, actually, that the, yeah. the, when error happens is something, then, I mean, wow, there is something wrong. Like, he made a mistake. I have to tell him he made, he made a mistake. And yeah. that, uh, because if behavior is offered, then it's not under stimulus control, so... Uh, there is no so much pressure, but when you cue something and your dog did not respond in cue, then we have a problem because it, right, yeah, there's an error and this right. has a big baggage actually. This error yeah. we don't and I like to think about error as feedback. So it's just an information. It's like okay, you did. It means that something in environment in the environment it's just evoked the behavior that you did not the one that I wanted. So probably you understand the cue differently and this is, this is relative for you right now. So uh, this was like, this is relevant, right? For you, this is not like the learner chooses the antecedents that are relevant. Absolutely. Not, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, I'm just thinking about it. Um, well, it's really, you know, it's a really good thing to actually, to say, uh, an error is information, yeah. but it's, it's also really important for trainers to have a plan mm -hmm. because otherwise you just freeze and your face looks really tight. Uh, yeah. you know, you go, Oh, yeah. what do I do? What do I do? He, mm -hmm. I said, I said down and he did a bow and, uh, what, uh, and, and the, the dogs can read your face, uh, mm -hmm. like, it's and a cue. <laughs> it, there's a cue. I mean, you'll see that your eyebrows go up or your, you hold your breath. Or, and so I, I worked really hard in my control as an illusion group. We, ha we thought and thought and thought about, well, if your dog does this, what will you do? If your dog does this, what will you do? And particularly with that class, because there was a lot of work with things like waiting for your cue to go get the food in the Zen bowl. Mm -hmm. and so our natural reaction when the dog goes off cue is to take the cover it or it, yeah. cover it or, and I was like, we, ha you have to think this through ahead because if you don't, you're going to have a, gonna yeah. you're going to have a knee jerk reaction and you're going to, you're going to try and block your dog off of that thing. And so everybody, everyone did a really nice job, but it was so, it was so hard. It's hard for me mm. to be like, Oh, okay. I, look at me. We would celebrate. Look, look, I let him eat it off mm -hmm. cue, you know, because, yes. and yes. then, but then now that temptation, which is not, we tried to make them not temptations. These were cues, the whole antecedents were cues. I, I, I was like, if you, if you let your dog eat the food, 
then you are for sure setting up a situation where there is no conflict, mm -hmm. where when the dog offers you the eye contact instead or whatever it is you're wanting, that we wanted a waiting behavior, mm -hmm. it tells you that the reinforcement history behind that waiting behavior is strong enough yeah. that the animal shows, oh boy, I get to wait for my cue. I, I mean, you can see it in their face when they're not conflicted. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When there's conflict, you put a temptation down and the dog really wants it. It's like, yeah, I have to try so hard not to take you it. You just see yeah. them just, I yeah. won't, I'm not going to move a muscle. I'm going to be really good. And yeah. uh, even when dogs are really good, I don't want my dogs to look that way. Um, I, right. So, but the, the answer is a very careful progression where, mm -hmm. where going to the bowl off cue doesn't happen very often. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's right. like, because it's often the question that I get is that, but what, like, when I say if error happens, just toss a treat and do another repetition, uh, just don't really uh, dwell over this error. And people ask, okay, but if I'm going to toss a treat every time error happens, isn't the toss treat going to reinforce the incorrect behavior? And my response is, of course, it's going to reinforce if it's going to happen every time. But if you know, because if it happens, then you have to respond somehow. I mean, you have to maintain the fluency of the session. So tossing a treat and changing what's going to happen next is the answer. So if you're going to ask for the same repetition, the same conditions, and your dog is unlikely to offer you the correct behavior, then if you're going to do it over and over again, then probably tossing a treat is going to reinforce that and you're going to have uh, an incorrect behavior. But right. What we want to do is we want to toss a treat and change something so the next behavior, next response is very likely to be the correct one that we can click. Right. Uh, right. And so I, I would say that if the dog goes off cue to the, to the Zen ball, like mm -hmm. you said, then really nothing happens for me. I mean, it's not a problem for me, but it's going to be a problem if you don't change something in the next repetition and he's going to go again and again and again, because then he's going to be reinforced for it. Like even without the click, obviously. But uh, this is just right. for us. this is just an information for us to change something in the antecedents to right. make the next behavior, uh, the, the correct behavior more likely to happen. Right. Well, that's why I really like um, the base position as a default. Mm -hmm. Because what I find, and that's why I kind of got into this thing that errors are not really, it, errors are only errors if we make the animal feel that they are wrong, yeah. right? If we think, if we're thinking, eh, wrong, oh, I hate must, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but if that's what we're thinking in our heads, mm, I know, then that's what the learner will feel. And that's pressure, right? That's like, you got to, you know, you missed the problem on your math quiz. Mm -hmm. and you're, you're going to get a C and you're not going to get an A, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, all that, all that baggage we have in our heads about yeah. from school and um, we, we bring that to our training and for our animals that none of that means anything, right? Like they don't have that in their heads. I mean, we can teach them that baggage, but that's not what they're thinking. So my goal always is that I want to be clear with my information that's important to me. So if I say sit and my dog lays down and I immediately just give him a cookie mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there might be a reason for that in some situations, but I also feel like that's not fair because now my sit cue, my down cue mm -hmm. is confusing. Mm -hmm. However, I also don't want it to be like, eh, dog is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because they probably were queuing off a head tilt off of yeah. my head or something. They're probably, you know, that's why there was we, something we that. in the environment that there's something that made right. that happen. So, but I still want to, I still want to be clear. So when I have this really strong uh, default position of uh -huh. in the absence of information from me, which for mm -hmm. me might be two seconds without any food, click or cues. Yeah. So in the absence of information from me for just a short, short, short time, a couple of seconds, mm -hmm. yeah. the best thing to do is just wait because this waiting position has a huge default 
or not default, uh, reinforcement history behind yeah. it. And if you look at my dog's face while he's waiting, he's like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. And then I can go right into the next thing. Mm -hmm. And we, it might be an easy behavior. It might be we walk around for a minute, which he really likes. It might be uh, um, uh, I might feed him for waiting. Mm -hmm. But there was a little moment of there was no click for that. Yeah, there was information. Mm -hmm. there, but, but this only works if the, if the animal has a very deep reinforcement history for the, the default behavior of, oh, in the absence of mm -hmm. information from my trainer for three two seconds, I do this thing. I find that So we're talking about LRS, right? I am talking about LRS. Um, that's how I mm -hmm. interpret an LRS and how I teach it. Um, I think there's a lot of debate about oh, yeah. what it is and where it came from and what the, but that's how I define it um, is that I don't think of it as, I don't even think of it as a least reinforcing scenario because that again makes it feel like I have to remove the reinforcer to mm -hmm. tell the animal that is incorrect. It's more a matter of what is the default position that my learner knows to do is is thrilled to do uh so there isn't actually a removal of any reinforcement there at all it's mm -hmm. oh uh, i didn't get clicked mom's still standing there with the food i offer this behavior this behavior will also be reinforced yeah but i was all i was still able to be clear mm -hmm. that uh that down really means down um yeah. just because i personally feel like I have seen a lot of my students get into trouble with immediate reset treat tosses. Okay. Partly because, like you said, like for you to do it, it doesn't happen very often. But for a, a novice trainer, mm -hmm. you're gonna tend to make, maybe you're tipping your head every time you cue, you do three in a row, mm -hmm. right? And- well, uh, yeah. you, and like, you know what I mean? And now yeah. three times, now your sit cue, your down cue really means sit or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I, that's how yeah. I think. Uh, so what I do actually is like with my students, because I find that many of them have, don't have a base position yet. And then uh, what I do is I ask them, if an error happens, I want you to toss the treat. And then do something that you know your dog's going to do. Just don't go and work on the same behavior. Just do something completely else. And then we can analyze the video and just think about what has happened. Like what caused this behavior to be a different right. one than that you wanted. Uh, right. And I find it sometimes, uh, I'm absolutely, I, I love the RS as you applicated. I mean, this is very clear information. Uh, but sometimes I find it easier for some students especially to do yeah. a treat toss and just change and go into something different because then they are, because I think that people get stuck into the, in the errors. Yeah. Like when yeah, they yeah. see the error happen, they will do anything to have to see the correct behavior. Yeah. This behavior, not a different one. And what I want to change is that leave it behind you. Okay. It happened. Nothing's going to change it. Let's move yeah. to something different that, you know, you both are going to be successful. So yeah. if yeah. you're if you if you cue the down and your dog just sit okay toss a treat and then do set a spin if it's easy for your dog or I'm just making things up right now just so you know do something do, do I something think it's good super easy and then we're gonna think about what happened with your down and we can break it into pieces maybe we can change the uh, lower the criteria and but it's gonna be in the next session yeah. That's so, very, that's like, very good to give. That's like a very good tool to yeah, give. It's like, and I think it's good because we teach students that you don't really have to pay that much attention to errors. We can deal with them later. We don't have to deal with an error when it happens. Like uh, Dr. Jesus Rosales really said that the worst moment to correct an error is when it happens. So yeah. I don't want them even to think that they have to make this happen correctly again. Like it didn't. Yeah. Okay. So nothing happens. It's not, yeah. it's not a thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great way to relieve pressure mm -hmm. because as you, just as you described it, you know, I must get the right, I must get my dog to do it correctly. Yeah. As soon as you have that mindset, 
then you're going to, you're going to have pressure. You're going to have pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that, then you're going to lose that feeling of joyful offering Mm -hmm. and become more of a have to more of a, in order to, in order to get that treat, you know, I have to do this. Um, and that's what we just try to avoid because we, we have so much power. We have all the power. We have all the reinforcement. We control um, them all. Yeah. All, yeah. And so I think it's just the more sensitive we can be mm-hmm. to how we're uh, laying that on our learners, um, it, the better, the better teachers we will be. Yeah. Um, and particularly with any behaviors that we would call self-control related. Mm-hmm. Um, that's uh, where I feel like I see the most conflict um, mm-hmm. in terms of an animal really having to work very hard uh, to to resist the thing you want them to not do, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, and for me, a conflict, a conflicted behavior is a lot of tension in the body. You'll see the mouth will be very tight usually. Often the eyeballs will flick over to the thing that they wish they could have, but they're mm-hmm. that because that's the only part of their body that's allowed to move, right? So they, yeah. you know, um, and there's just a tightness to it that I don't like to see. Uh, I really like to see this kind of, I like a more, I love a, for what's appropriate for my dogs is an open mouth. Um, mm-hmm. That's not appropriate for all dogs, but an open yeah. mouth, um, a very uh, stable, position Mm -hmm. so usually my guys are in a stand so the stand should feel balanced that's the Mm -hmm. other thing you can see when there's conflict they'll be kind of a tilt Mm -hmm. toward Mm -hmm. the thing (laughs) and they're not actually balanced on all four feet they're not Mm -hmm. fully with you it's like their mind is somewhere else yeah and they're right so so i really want this i want this full balance Mm -hmm. and i uh i want um I call it a natural respiration, so a natural breathing rate. Mm-hmm. Um, they can feel it, you. You would describe it more as engaged rather mm-hmm. than um, yeah. uh, restrained, right? So that's uh, you know want to operationalize what it looks like when you and you can put down eventually if you use a very careful errorless progression. I would call it trust. The animal trusts mm-hmm. that. Either you will release them to the thing that they're waiting for, or you will release them to something that is also fantastic. Like, let's say it's totally something they can't have. The and thing that's going to happen if they're going to go off cue. And if they go off cue, yeah. there's nothing happens if, yeah, it just happened. It just happened. It's like, yeah. Um, so it's amazing what will happen over time. Um, I have a funny story. Um, I do a lot of, games where I, I ask my dogs to wait. Um, cause I like my, uh, I like my stay behaviors to have a great expectation of, of really fun things. So I make games out of it and I put my dogs in the kitchen and we often play a game where the, I ask them to wait and then I'll go hide a uh, really high value food. Okay. Like they have these dried chicken jerky. They love mm-hmm. these things and I hide them all over the house and then I release them mm-hmm. to go find them. And so I did this the other day, but I I tried a new game. I thought I will go hide and I had all the chicken and I was going to call them to me. And the idea was they find me and I give them all the food. Yeah. But it was hilarious. I called them and called them and called them and no response. Like I got no (laughs) response. And I was like, this is very unusual. Uh And I walked back in the kitchen and both of them were, part, I mean, they had that, all those, be, those characteristics I told you, the happy <laughs> face, the, the, their balanced feet. They hadn't moved one foot out of position <laughs> from where I left them. But they had this look of like, we are waiting for you to release us to our chicken game. And I realized uh, that for them, because we had played the other game, I had to be there. I had to come back and be in view for the release cue to work. Okay. And they were, they were telling me that's how this game works. Yeah. Uh, so you don't know how to play it. You don't have to play the game properly. It was so funny. But what I liked was how they looked when I uh-huh. came back to them. Um, 
Now, any, I think, I think any other context, like a park, if I went and hid behind a tree yeah, and called them, I, yeah. I mm -hmm. think they would come because the, it's, again, it's that power, the power of the expectations based on the context of being yeah. at home. Um, but it's a nice example of how strong this can be. You know, um, mm -hmm. there was a time, I think a long time ago, my husband, um, we used to have a thing where one of our dogs would lay on her bed mm -hmm. and you put down her breakfast mm -hmm. and then you just say, okay, you can have it. Um, it's not like the old way of you have to sit to get your breakfast. Yeah. It just became a habit of she would yes. run to her bed and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one time my husband put down her bowl and he went and took a shower, but he forgot to say release cue. And the food was there. It was sitting there. He came back and she was drooling, just waiting. And again, we, it wasn't set up as a temptation. She, there was no penalty. It was just such a strong habit for her to wait for the work. <laughs> for the work. So this stuff can be really powerful and but without any need for the negative punishment or the um right with the and and for me that's the pressure the pressure comes we mentioned unclear criteria yeah. can create pressure negative um, reinforcement contingency anytime you shift into a negative reinforcement contingency um which is you do the thing to get what you want or you avoid it somehow the animal avoids it, so they will go sniff. Yeah. Barking is a quite a, an effective avoidance behavior. Some dogs will get aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. I have met dogs in the shelter. You say sit, and they come at you like. Yeah. And it's a, a or, way. To, yeah. Or it, you have a very energetic, like hectic response, like running around, barking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or that cra crazy social appeasement, that really wild kind where they pummel and lick and lick yeah. and lick and lick. I often feel, I'm always like, they're like, oh, she's so friendly. And I'm, mm, I, yeah. I, like, yeah. <laughs> I would call that a, another kind of conflict is yeah. mm -hmm. I'm desperate to be near you, but I have learned that if I do this behavior, yeah. nothing, yeah. nothing bad happens. Um, so that yeah, social pressure is another one. Uh, direct eye contact, leaning over, overwhelming dogs with lots of mm. petting. Um, yeah. That's all a way to put pressure on a, on dogs. Um, what else did we? I was just trying to sum up all the things we talked about. Yeah, and one um, was um, we talked about environmental pressure, right? Environmental pressure. Um, working in a room full of dogs, uh, uh, and they're all staring at you. I once uh, had someone. There was a situation where I saw a dog that was doing. It wasn't at the nose work class mm -hmm. and the hide was placed on the crate of another dog and yeah a barking german <sighs> shepherd oh my and gosh it was a tiny dog the, the one that was looking like searching and you could see that he found the hide and he tried so hard to get there but it was so much conflict there because i mean there was a dog in this crate that was barking crazy I right. wouldn't cl go close to that crate. Right. And so this is another sort of environmental pressure that we put. It's not only environmental here. It's also, um, what we call it? It's negative reinforcement. Yeah, it's going to be aversive stimuli. Gonna... Well, yeah, if you, um, it's almost like uh, c conflict is created when you have a uh, contingency piled up. Mm. So yeah. if, you, if you power through, the scary thing or the painful thing, if you power through it, you're going to get your reinforcement on the other side. Uh, so we can right? have also pressure on, uh, I would say, on respondent behavior. It's like uh, on respondent team, like that if you, so habituation sort of. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of working dogs, that's what they want them to do, right? Is um, I think, I think I was, I, well, I spoke to a detective, a detective, detection dog trainer once and he was the way he put it was yeah you've got to find the reinforcer that your dog will walk across glass yeah. okay. to I mean because when you when you search a bombed out building mm -hmm. you're gonna walk it's gonna they have to be able to do it um mm -hmm. so I mean you can think of it that way yeah. in terms of I I will find the thing that will make you do this thing 
again, even if it's uncomfortable, or <laughs> that's not the way I like to do it, uh, you teach a behavior to such a high degree of fluency mm -hmm. that the environmental issues do not, they don't really register. They're not relevant to the, 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 the job. Uh, the job is so clear. Um, yeah. And the reinforcement history behind it. It's not the turkey dinner that you hang in front of the dog at the end. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the it's millions, the it's that millions of repetitions of being successful and confident and having good outcomes um, that propels the dog through those challenges. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, like I have, um, in my nose work class, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we actually, it's an oddly structured nose work class where we do a lot of exercises all at once, which is, you know, most nose work classes you do it one at a time. Mm -hmm. But in my nose work class, we often work together as a group. Yeah. But I'm really careful. So they each dog has their little work area. Mm -hmm. And frequently the we'll be working targeting exercises. And and people don't realize it, but if you put your your target facing the room, mm. right, with all the dogs coming out, mm -hmm. right? Even if the dog is friendly, that it's is not fine. Yeah. It's not okay. So, mm -hmm. so I'm like, no, we have to turn it around and put the, the high, put the, the targets in the corners, yeah. the walls. So mm -hmm. the dog is most confidently mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. moving towards the thing. And the same thing, I was at a seminar with a, a wonderful seminar with Julie Simons. And we were doing an exercise where uh, it was kind of a restrained, uh, I, hold the, I hold my dog, Julie runs off with the odor box, puts yeah. it down. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And simple things people can do so instead of having your dog run towards a, uh, the audience mm -hmm. do it the other way yeah. we turned it around so she could run to a quiet corner of the room it, these are things we can do for our dogs all the time we can yeah. think about we can set right? the environment yes absolutely and sometimes yeah. those tiny tiny changes really matter right because i didn't want any hesitation from my my 14 year old mm. dog because yeah. I knew there was already environmental pressure. Uh, we were at a seminar. There's already things. And I didn't want her to like go, oh, I don't know if I know how to do this. Should I do it? Yeah. Should I want to just really be confident. So that's something we can always do for our, uh, our learners to relieve pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then we talked about different strategies for mistakes. Because mm -hmm. um, I definitely think one of the biggest pressures I've always felt in my life has been those, um, do you know your times tables? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, get up in front of the class and recite your times tables and you will get a sticker mm -hmm. if you get them all right. Mm -hmm. But, and when, how about this for pressure? And when the whole class gets a sticker, we have a party. So guess what happens if you make oh, a mistake? Oh, God. Right? The whole class is waiting for you to get this test right, no matter how, how much, uh, this actually happened to me, no matter how much I studied when I got up in that context. You knew nothing. I can't remember anything. Yeah. Um, so, but we do that to our dogs a lot, you know, uh, especially competition is really hard. Yeah. Um, and so the more thoughtful we can be about it, the more, you know, we can think about this stuff in advance. Um, the better we I, I just heard them, yeah. Right, and also, be forgiving because you might make a mistake mm -hmm. and go like me with doing Tucker this morning. I asked him to do a backing up behavior and he said, no. And I just said, okay, then we don't have to do that today. Let's go do something else fun. This is not, you know, uh, a life or death situation. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason you don't want to step backwards. Maybe your back legs hurt today, whatever. And so, yeah, so but it's it. People need to know that that's okay. That, yeah, that's absolutely okay. And sometimes it's not. It's like uh, we're just tossing treats. And if you toss a treat when you cue the behavior, and you toss a treat and you go into different behavior, like my strategy for my students. Yeah, which and I think then, is good. But then someone may ask, but what if next time I'm going to cue this behavior and the same thing happens? And my response would be, but you're not going to do. You're not going to cue it in the same conditions. You're going to change something to make sure it's going to happen. And because, and if it's not going to happen in easier conditions, then maybe we should dig deeper and see what really is happening. Because sometimes it's going to be a medical reason. 
Sometimes right. it's going to be uh, fatigue or like we have to figure out why something that was happening is suddenly not happening anymore. Right. Uh, even if you lower the criteria and even if you go back into the early stages of this behavior and you still have some issues, then I would really dig deeper and I would look in the medical thing, really. Yeah. Yeah. But I was thinking back on what happened this morning. Mm. I was asking for it in a new context. Mm. Um, not where we normally practice it. Mm. And I had added a verbal cue. Okay. Which I always say, it, verbal cues do that. Like verbal cues sometimes bring up a, a have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm going to add a verbal, verbal cue and then we're going to do it. And, and that's when I got the bark, 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 bark. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting, but I, I have a feeling if I went back to how I trained it mm -hmm. without the cue, without a verbal cue back mm -hmm. in the context where I trained it, which yeah. is along this wall um, mm -hmm. that makes it easier for him. I bet you uh, we could get it back again, but that's those, that's the information that I can process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and you that's don't the kind of feedback. To, yeah. I don't have to do it now. Yeah, but, this, yeah. I think this is the most important thing. You don't have to do it now. It's not going to ruin the behavior. If you just forget about it this time and do something else, if you're right. going to, you know, take a break and do something different, it's not, it's not the end of the world. It's like, you don't have to decide now. You can take the time, analyze the video here if you have. If not, just think about it and mm -hmm. try another day. Yeah, exactly. So these are all great things that I hope people are mm -hmm. maybe just like make a flow chart. <laughs> yeah. There are, there are proactive ways uh -huh. um, to prevent pressure from happening. There's uh -huh. a change of mindset that I think all of us have to keep just. Mm -hmm reminding ourselves because we all have that baggage, you know, like the times tables with a sticker. Uh, yeah. That's not what training should feel like for our animals. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, anytime we feel ourselves stuck in a have to, you know, you, that's a great flow chart, like take a breath and move around or take a breath and throw a cookie. Mm -hmm. Take a breath, yeah, switch, go, switch gears. Move yourself away from the yeah. Exactly. And then there's nothing wrong sometimes with, uh, I'm in a new environment. My dog is staring at everything. I'm seeing a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. I am not going to ask for any behaviors here at all. Yeah. Like people don't realize that's allowed. You, you do, you know, you can just feed treats for looking at you. If your dog can't and take the treats. And it's still a behavior. I, exactly. If your dog can't take the treats, I would probably go home. Um, but if your dog can at least go, hey, I'm interested in your food. Can I look around? Mm -hmm. And then you're actually yes. doing really, really good training with no pressure because yep. there's no agenda. Mm -hmm. um, I frequently go places and say, what's your agenda, dog? Mm. And their agenda is usually, you know, well, Tucker, his agenda is moving, mm. a lot of movement. <laughs> and Zoe's agenda okay. is usually like roll in the grass. Oh, so we have similar dogs, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but that's another way to relieve pressure is get the human agenda Off the out of there. Schedule. Yeah. There's, uh, it's not, uh, there's no agenda. I, I used to love being a nanny for little children, mm. like two, you know, two year olds, three year olds, yeah, yeah. Uh, a long time ago. And my favorite thing was, you know, the parents would leave all day. We had, we had six hours, mm. no agenda. Uh, that's cool. So like if we wanted to walk to the corner, we could spend an hour, uh, you know, jumping in a puddle and learning how to blow dandelions because there was just happened to be dent. You know what I mean? But that feeling that it, that is, you don't have to. that's my definition of no pressure is you have lots of time and there's no real agenda and you're just connecting and enjoying things together. So there's all these reinforcers, you know, uh, eye contact and smiles and giggles and splashing in the puddle. And, and that's what I want for my dogs. And that's what I want my training to feel that way. Um, I don't always achieve it because I have, perf I'm a high standards for myself. And I sometimes feel like I bring that in. I have then, the same, but yeah, you know, but I want it to feel like there is no agenda here. 
and we are just enjoying dandelions in a park, but we just happen to have targets and clickers mm -hmm. and things, you know, so but that's my no goal. Pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> it fits that's perfectly. My, yeah, yeah, so there. Absolutely. That's, that's I have one, one story I want to share. Like, okay. Which is yeah, yeah. at the beginning about, like, we want to toss treats uh, on the floor and the dog to say, like, but I, I want to just offer behaviors. I don't care about treats. Like, recently I've been doing, <laughs> like, I have three dogs and they all want to work at the same time. And I have to work with just one of them. Oh, and it's so hard. Oh, so it hard. is. It, it's very hard to decide, like, which one is, I rotate them. Like, one day it's Gunya, <laughs> one day it's Gatsik, one day it's Gatsik, and then back again. And my strategy was, when the time of a training comes, I know they are following me, following me, all three. Like, they're walking behind me. And I don't look at them. I, I, I just, <laughs> I don't look at them. I go prepare my stuff. Uh -huh. And they're always always behind me, all free. And this is a lot of pressure. And then when I wanted to take just one of them, my strategy was toss treats on the floor and call only the one you want to take. And it was working perfectly. The two got into, you know, sc treat scatter. The one that I wanted to work with went with me. It was all perfect. Until recently when I tossed a treat and they all look at treats and uh-uh, doesn't work. We are going with you. <laughs> and... I'm like, but trees are there. Just go. I just push them. I'm like, go there. There are your trees. I they cost more of them. I'm like, look. Mm, now we know what you are doing. We are going with you. And I was like, but there are the same treats I'm gonna give him in the training room. Like you can have them now. With, with nothing. Mm, no. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. No. We are going with you. So now that my strategy hilarious. changes and. I have to ask, when I ask them for a certain behavior, and then I do a treat scatter, then I have the time to run away. Ah, there we go. <laughs> and, and then they accept the food after they got to work a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Before you know it, they're going to be making you do full training sessions with all three. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's how um, I solved it, is I just bring both dogs up to the training room, but they mm -hmm. have stations. Mm-hmm. And I bring their whole breakfast because mm -hmm. I, re I reinforce so much. But mm -hmm. um, that's the only way we do it is so they're basically both working. One is working on waiting. The other one gets to work. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way. The only other way I can do it in my house is I have to put them both in the car and bring them in one at a time. <laughs> and then they can do it because they're, they're experienced dogs yeah. about, you know, wait, waiting. And that's the only way. And this is a good problem to have as is. Uh, they are so eager mm -hmm. to work, you know, and I have two very different dogs. I have the low, I have the softy, right? Mm -hmm. The one that supposedly, uh, she is the worst at demanding uh, work time and food time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so I just think, I, I think it's a wonderful problem to have um, because it, it means that you're mostly operating Nobody is perfect, but it means when you have dogs like this, it means you're working mostly, you know, in the good side of the force. Yeah. And mostly the experience they're having uh, with you feels that way. It feels like there isn't a have to. It's, I, it's a very strong want to. You know, I want to do this. Um, but I think we have to talk about pressure they apply on us because I don't think they realize <laughs> how much oh, pressure they actually use. It's... Uh, in the evening when there is a time for a walk <laughs> and Gabcha comes and he's looking at me and I see him, and I feel it. I feel that he's behind me. Yes. And when I look around, he makes this funny face and I know it's a second from barking. It's a second from jumping. Then mm -hmm. tell me like it's time to go for a walk. So they are using a lot of pressure actually. And I think they should take some of your courses actually. Yeah, they need to listen <laughs> to, the, to this. Um, I do have established upstairs and I'm, I couldn't go upstairs today because there's a lot of construction noise, uh -huh. but I have um, an office now. I didn't have an office for months, but now I have my office back and I have established a condition. This is the one place in the house upstairs that when I am at the desk, it is an extinction cue. Mm -hmm. It's right. official. It's clear. It's, I will not interact with you 
Well, I'm not, I, I still. How have you done this? I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I always interact with them. And even if I say to myself that this is going to be a place where no, me, like nothing ever happens. It always happened because when I feel this, I, I, this head behind me looking at me, I always turn and smile. And this is enough. It's, it's, it was reinforced. And they're going to yep. try again and again and again. I know it's, it's hard, but I, I mean, I, I'm not super cold. I mean, if they come and say hello, I'll say hi. But then oh. I, I say, I say, I'm not, I'm not working anymore. Mm. And then I go back to my work. I am careful to only right now, cause I'm teaching them this rule. Mm. We only do this when they have had enough work already. Oh yeah, obviously. Yeah. Otherwise um, it would be not for it would be, well, and I don't want extinction. You know, I don't actually yeah. want barking. I don't want that to come so back. So you create a favorable contingency, favorable, uh, like antecedents uh, yeah. to, to have this behavior be more likely. Yeah. Yeah. So then they go, oh, and I put these really comfortable beds out. Mm, yeah. That's their cue. Um, I try not to do a lot of feeding. Mm -hmm. You know, in other situations, I'll feed for, you know, calm behavior or whatever. But in this situation, again, I want it to be really, really clear. Just this desk with this chair. When I'm in this chair at this desk, everywhere else in the house, not, not true. But, um, but yeah, so now we've switched the whole discussion around. And we're, now we're talking about how to clarify for your learners uh, when, pressuring not to you, apply pressure. when pressuring you is not going to work. Yes. Um, yeah, because <laughs> this is what's happening. Here we go. I've been, he's been really good this whole time. But can you uh, see him? So there yeah. we go. And I'm I'm not at my desk upstairs. Uh -huh. Right. So and this it's been work. Yeah, this is gonna work eventually. We start with the breathing and the but this is so much better than mm -hmm. what he used to do, right? He used to just bark at me. So Yeah. This is this I'm is happy yeah. with this. And I reinforce it as often as I can because I think this is the kind of learner I want. Uh yeah. Well, Perfect. Good. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful episode. And I hope you guys also enjoyed it as much as we did. Yes. Thank you and so much. See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.